So this morning we're going to conclude Nehemiah chapter 2, so we're going to be reading verses 11 through 20. So if you're turning in your Bibles, that's Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning with verse 11. It says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. When I moved on toward the fountain gate, then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. Because as yet, I had said nothing to the Jews, or the priests, or the nobles, or the officials, or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, Do you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me, and what the king had said to me. They replied, Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But then Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it. They mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, The God of heaven will give us success. He, we, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that as we've read your word and as we look deeper into it, that our eyes are opened up to the reality of, of the world we live in and the circumstances that we find ourselves in, very much like Jerusalem was at that time and, and Nehemiah and the preparations that it took to move forward to rebuild not only the city walls and the gates, but also the sanctuary of that relationship with you, the sanctity of that relationship. Lord, we just pray that we can put this into application to our own lives as we move forward and that we would always be aware and cognizant of your presence with us through your Holy Spirit, that portion of your power that you place within us when we come to you through your son Jesus and the waters of baptism and those that have not come to a relationship with you, that they would just know that you are a loving God that is even there with them. Lord, we just pray all of this through your Son's precious and holy name. Amen. So before we begin, I have worked a number of jobs in a wide variety of industries. And even within the one industry that I've probably spent more time than any other, the restaurant industry, I have had a staggering array of experience from fast food to casual dining. And regardless of the differences, which at times were vast, some things still stay the same. Of the restaurants that I worked at that did not serve breakfast, all opened for business at 11 o'clock. Yet all had the kitchen staff arriving by 8 or 9 o'clock at the latest. And those that served breakfast were staffed three hours before they opened. Now in writing a 20-30 minute sermon, typically what you hear on a Sunday, I can spend anywhere from two to sometimes up to ten hours preparing. It depends most upon the depth, depth of the scripture, of the context, depth of the historic, other historical factors, um, the depth of the commentaries. And of course, some sermons are exploited by God's Spirit moving me, guiding the words onto the paper. And of course, that same Spirit, I feel there's times that his hand is, is leading me deeper and deeper into study, which actually prolongs the process. So sometimes he makes it quicker and easier, sometimes he makes it go a little bit longer, which is great uh, in, in a variety of ways, uh, because I learn at the same time, and hopefully that we all learn from these experiences. The point of this, though, is to show that that work that comes before the work, which yields the results, that preparation. And one of the restaurants that I worked at made a delicious lasagna. And occasionally we would run out and people just couldn't fathom it. And they would simply say, well, make more. 
What they did not understand is the 20 minutes it took just to prepare it to go into the oven, nor the fact that it required four hours in order to bake thoroughly and set properly. Most simply see the active work or just the end results. Nehemiah took four months to get around to speaking with the king about rebuilding Jerusalem. And now he had arrived in Jerusalem, and he waited another three days before he got started. This wasn't time wasted. It was likely spent planning out how to proceed and praying continually, as he had been for the previous four months. Now, once, uh, once ready, he began the actual prep work. He went out through the valley gate, traveling along the perimeter of the city wall to inspect it thoroughly. And he moved from place to place. In one area, it says the damage was so extensive that he could not get through on his mount. And from there, he went up to the valley in order to survey the bigger picture. He wanted to see the whole scene. He needed to see it from another perspective. But he says he did all of this by night. Why is that? See, by the light of day, it would have been much easier to see the full damage and what it would take to fix it. And there's obviously, going out at night, there's obviously no electricity. And it's, it's highly doubtful that the, with the constant threat from, from their enemies that they would be illuminating the, the most vulnerable points of the wall with torches or fires. And likewise, I think there's little chance that Nehemiah himself carried a torch or a lantern to see by for the very same reason. It is highly probable, though, that God provided a clear night and a bright moon for which to see by. God allowed him to be able to inspect it at night, but this, this still doesn't answer that question of, of why. Why at night? And I think probably for the same reason he would have been averse to inspecting the walls and the gates with the light. God's enemies surrounded them, and the task that they faced was seemed insurmountable. And that the moment their enemies, we, we read about the fact that the moment their enemies uh, got word of Nehemiah's plan, they began to mock and ridicule the Jews. And that doesn't sound that bad, does it? Not just a little bit of mocking and ridicule. You, you can take that. Just man up, right? Yet that's the same tactic, the very same tactic that's used today to silence God's people. Society around us calls good evil and evil good, and most either nod, even good Christians, either just nod in agreement or they just sit silently, quietly, not speaking up, not saying anything, because they're afraid of the mocking and the ridicule that isn't as that it is isn't as inconsequential. It isn't as eh, it's nothing as we like to think it is sometimes. So they were being mocked and ridiculed. But not only that, but they were being accused of rebelling against the king. Treason! An offense that carried a punishment of death, it still does today. So not only are they being mocked and ridiculed, but now they're being, they're being called treasonous. They're rebelling against the king. And they knew the consequences. They would understand the consequences of this. And the Jews were already in great trouble and distress, and, and disgrace, it said in, in, verse, in chapter 1. And they were likely very overwhelmed by everything that was going on. And the truth is, is that had their enemies seen Nehemiah surveying the walls and, and surmised his intentions, they probably would have gotten to the people before Nehemiah could. They probably would have started with them mocking and ridiculing and, and calling them traitors and treasonous and, and rebellion, rebellious. They probably would have gotten to them then. And it might have been too great of a blow to their hope. At that point, once Nehemiah finally got to them and, and offered words of encouragement for God's hand being with them, it, it, may, have, it may have rung a little hollow in their ears. It may have failed to stir their hearts. A little bit of too little too late at that point. See, Nehemiah's plan to rebuild the walls and restore the gates would have been infinitely more difficult. Not that it 
would have been impossible, or that couldn't happen. After all, God was with them. Just that it would have been much more apparent as God's direct intervention rather than an obedient act of faith by his people. If the people's spirit had been crushed because the enemies had already attacked them before Nehemiah could get a solid plan of action to them, it would have been obvious that God was working for them rather than them being obedient and following God's will. Nehemiah told no one the plan until he himself understood it. Just walking in and saying, hey, let's rebuild this wall. Who's with me? You know, it might sound well and good, but how is that accomplished? This is a big deal. There's a lot of work here. And so that's what Nehemiah did in secret. He was planning and preparing. This way he could present a detailed course of action to a people who, though troubled and disgraced, still held faith and hope. Faith and hope that surely were renewed, strengthened by what God had done thus far to open the king's eyes and change his heart. And with this, they wanted to get to work right away. Let's start rebuilding the wall. And the next four chapters gives us an account of, of that work as well as the opposition they continue to face. Remember, they're surrounded by God's enemies. And they're continuing to face this opposition. And yet they, they work on, they press on, because they had a plan, because Nehemiah presented a plan to them. And chapter 3 especially reveals the detail of his plan to rebuild. Each family and area were responsible for specific tasks. All of the individual assignments that he doled out to them allowed them to accomplish their work and not only accomplish it, but to do so in an astonishingly small amount of time. People were amazed at how quickly they rebuilt the walls and restored the gates once they had finished. They couldn't believe it. But they faced that opposition every step of the way. And I love Nehemiah's response to the enemies when they, when they started to mock and ridicule and accuse them of, of rebelliousness. And he says, the God of heaven will give us success. The Jewish people worked together, but it was recognized as God's hand guiding and completing the work. And again, Nehemiah refers to himself and the people as God's servant. They willingly followed him and, as promised, were gathered to him in the holy city of Jerusalem. These others, they did not know God. They opposed him and his people. They tried to deny his power in their lives. And they tried to deny his power in the region of Judah. And this is why Nehemiah tells them they have no share, no claim, no right to Jerusalem. For it is for his people, the place where he promised to restore them, to redeem them from their slavery from their troubles, from their trials. In our day of instant meals, instant access, instant information, instant results, instant gratification, God says, stop! He reminds us through his servant, Nehemiah, to slow down. Be still. Think, pray, and most of all, trust. Nehemiah continued to trust God and to lean heavily upon him throughout the entire process. You know, the immediacy of things can be good at times, but too often what is found in an instant is of the world, not of God. How many times, how many times in his book, in his word, has he said things such as, be still and know that I am God? How many times? 
Peter said to be ready always to give an answer. Right? Be ready always to give an answer. To be ready is to be prepared. To be prepared means doing the work that comes before the work that yields the results. Do the prep work. Know God through his word. Know him through his son Jesus. Know him through the spirit, that portion of his power that he places within us. When we come to him through his son Jesus. Inspect the walls and gates of your life. Make a plan to rebuild them according to his specifications so that they are powerful to resist the evils of this world. Look at the bigger picture. Stand back and see how you can align your life with his will. Slow down. Be still. Think. Pray. And most of all, trust. Trust in the God that is with you through every up and down, high and low. Trust in the God that guides you and strengthens you to do what you cannot do alone. Before you begin, remember that. go back to God. To your Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you so much for the blessing of this day. For this day of, of life that we can honor you and give you glory for the wonderful things that you've done, for this creation that you've placed us within, for the very breath in our lungs. Lord, we thank you for these blessings. We thank you for your unending love. We thank you for your incredible grace that is poured out upon us through your son Jesus, the sacrifice that he willingly made as he served you. And Lord, may we in turn serve you willingly, lovingly, that we would, when faced with the troubles of this world, that we would stop make preparation to continue forward and to know that our guide for such preparations, our guide for such works is your word which reveals to us your will through all things. Lord, I pray that you be with each one within the sound of my voice, that you guide us and strengthen us and help us most of all to feel your presence among us through Jesus' name we pray. Amen.